Have you ever had the experience of identifying with a character in a fictional world? Well, if so, you're definitely not alone. This is a very common query that I get on a regular basis. Over the last couple of weeks, I've had many readers tell me that they identify with Anna Karenina, Levin, Don Quixote, Sancho Panza, Anne Elliot from Persuasion, Raskolnikov from Crime and Punishment, and Marcel Proust, the narrator of In Search of Lost Time. Now, as far as I'm concerned, sympathising with these characters, identifying with the writers of these great novels is kind of the point. Art and literature is a mirror held up to nature, a mirror held up to ourselves. I always implore you to read these books as mirrors. When we read Shakespeare's sonnets, we're looking at a Rorschach test, an inkblot test. What's reflected is projected, and this is why when you have a gap between rereading a certain novel, the novel can feel completely new, like a completely new story after many years. It's not because the novel's changed, but because we have changed. If you leave to Two, three, four, five years in between your rereading of books like Anna Karenina or Crime and Punishment, then of course the novel is going to take on a different quality by virtue of what you bring to it, bringing your lived experience, bringing your trials and tribulations. And of course, these novels, particularly the great ones, are often a reflection of what we're working through right now. If we find ourselves particularly enraptured by, and enamoured with a certain novel, it's often indicative of a certain stage in our life that we are going through. And conversely, if we find we absolutely cannot abide a certain novel, well, very often it's not the fault of the novel and it's not our fault either. We might just need to come back to it in a couple of years when we can see our own life more accurately mirrored in it. To keep things simple, I think we can categorize characters into two types when it comes to reading ourselves in them or up against them. We either see the character as a reflection of part of ourselves, our temperament, our personality, our wishes, dreams, and desires, or the character is an aspirational figure, a template for morality, benevolence, and virtue, something to aspire towards, something to aim at. This is why we very often identify with troubled characters rather than the perfect characters, the idealized characters, because perfection is not real life. That's the beauty at the heart of the aesthetic philosophy of Kintsugi, gluing a broken piece of pottery back together, leaving chips and highlighting where it has been broken by a really distinct colorized glue, such as a golden glue, like you can see here. Imperfection is perfection. And we fall in love with these characters often not because they're perfect, but because we see something of ourselves mirrored in their flaws. They're eminently human, we understand them. And if we understand them, then we also feel understood. Art does have a social utility. It can soothe and calm down. It can be a training ground to help us work through our own problems. And if we do see something of ourselves reflected in a particularly tragic character, we can use that to abort our own tragic demise. Historically, novels have been looked down upon, frowned upon for many years. Escapism and vicarious experience has been denigrated, but vicarious experience is endlessly instrumental and instructive. It helps us work through our issues consciously and unconsciously. Literature is most certainly full of aspirational characters, characters who instruct us on how best to live. I'm thinking of Jean Valjean in Les Miserables. I'm thinking of Anne Elliot in Austin's Persuasion. But sometimes we're treated to characters who are somewhat of a realistic work in progress or symbolize a part of us. Could you imagine Don Quixote, the idealist, quixotic knight errant, without his faithful squire, Sancho Panza? No, because they come as a unit and we don't see ourselves entirely in one or the other all of the time. We flip flop between them. Sancho Panza is the down to earth, physicalized, Freudian reality principle, whilst Don Quixote is the idealist, the fantasist. And depending on what time we're reading Cervantes' masterpiece, we'll see ourselves more fully in one or the other. And the delight for that novel in particular is watching these two characters change. And on an unconscious level, it inspires us with hope that we too can change, that there is some wiggle room in our destiny. We watch as the knight errant becomes a little bit more down to earth by virtue of his conversations with Sancho Panza, and we watch Panza, the physicalized reality principle, become a little bit more idealistic through his conversations with the knight errant. 
That novel teaches us how best to live with great comic effect, but if we want to read something that hits home a little harder, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina can be a tragic read. It is perfectly normal for us to see something of ourselves in Anna Karenina and in Levin. We know that Tolstoy most certainly did, and anyone who knows something of Tolstoy's biography will ascertain that not only did he invest himself in Anna, not only did he invest himself in Levin, but he invested himself in almost every single character, including Vronsky. To see oneself mirrored in a character that may not be completely aspirational, because I don't think many would ascertain that Anna Karenina is an aspiration figure. We don't aspire to replicate her lived experience, but we do sympathise, we do pity, and we may look on and think, hey, you're making some bad decisions here and you're in a hole, but we may also realise that we have the benefit of perspective, historical perspective, and the perspective of not actually being mired in the situation. This is the virtue of Clarissa by Samuel Richardson as well. We befriend the central protagonist, and she is an embodiment of virtue, but we're also in a collaborative act with Richardson, kind of like gods looking over the universe, thinking, ah, don't do that, or if only you'd done this, or only done that, or if you'd said this instead of said that, and that's a smug place to find oneself. But it allows us to exercise some compassion and sharpen our empathy. Very often when we read these great books, we find ourselves sympathising with, identifying with, and simply understanding characters who, had they been real people in our lives, perhaps we wouldn't have given them time of day. Perhaps they wouldn't be our kind of people. Perhaps we wouldn't want to spend any time with them at all. By virtue of reading as lived experience, we can not only live a thousand lifetimes in one, but we can meet more people than we have the time or potential to in our life here today. Meeting these characters and understanding what makes them tick, understanding what motivates them, what keeps them up at night, helps us better talk not only to ourselves, of course, but to other people in our day-to-day -day lives. And there's definitely no shame with finding oneself overtly identifying with characters who may be suffering with mental health issues. Anna Karenina, again, Raskolnikov, most certainly, and Dostoevsky wrote that book so he didn't have to commit the crime himself, and we as readers read it so we don't have to either. In Anna Karenina, we see what can happen when one finds themselves in a hole and keeps digging. And at some point in that narrative, we are offered a choice. There is an exchange of energy between Anna and Levin. Levin, who is most certainly suffering as acutely as Anna, finds meaning and salvation mowing in the fields, and he is on the rise. Anna, however, is on a downward spiral, and we get to live both positions. And by doing so, hopefully identify the pitfalls in our own lives before they become too significant. Emerson, writing about history, said that history is all of us. This is why we read and relish the accounts of the rise and fall of great kings and queens, men and women of the state, is because it applies directly to us. Many have said if we know nothing of history, it is doomed to repeat itself. And this is why we read great literature too. Anybody wondering if it's a downfall or a poor reflection of themselves when they find something of themselves in the characters is wrong. It attests to a very deep reading and a skill, a skill that many do not have, of bringing your lived experience and your whole self to the work. It also attests to a particularly robust imagination. As we grow older and we leave childhood behind, we also leave our imaginative prowess behind as well. And this is a shame. This is a skill that many of us need to relearn. And the best way to relearn summoning our cognitive strength, our emotional connection to other people, and our imaginative powers is by connecting with these great books again. The great books are where we go to strengthen our own moral compass and resolve. They help us empathize with other people and better talk to other people. They sharpen our own self-communication. Intrapersonal communication is just as important, if not more important, than interpersonal communication. They give us hope and a vision for the future, and they help us avert disaster and shepherd in our own success. So if you ever find yourself identifying with a character in a novel, then remember you are most certainly not alone. You are part of a group of deep readers who are bringing themselves fully to the works. And if you find yourself struggling to identify with, sympathize with certain characters or authors, I would implore you to slow down and really summon 
your dormant childhood imagination and try to get inside their shoes, inside their mind, inside their heart. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it, please hit the like button and subscribe and let us know in the comments below, if it's not too personal, which characters you find yourself most identifying with and sympathizing with. Have a lovely day and happy reading.